My name is, is Daniel Inberg, and as mentioned, I'm the professor in the thermodynamics and metallurgical processes. What, what does that actually mean? So it means that when you are either running a current uh, metallurgical process or planning to develop a new one, perhaps uh, it's good to check with me, first of all, that is this even is this feasible from a chemical and a energetic uh, point of view, or is it even possible? <clears throat> what uh, we do in my research group, we, we study this using various experimental methods, but also develop different types of modeling tools to be able to, to give these predictions. However, as uh, Rodrigo also mentioned here about uh, ages, historical ages that were uh, named after metals, I go even further back. So. This talk is about the role of inorganic melts in high temperature industrial processes. However, my personal interest when I started studying in, at the universities was more on natural processes. And so you actually, if you think of high temperature melts in, na in the nature, what you typically would see is, what you see here, it would be lavas from volcanic eruptions and as you also likely have been hearing in the news recently, you know, very, very relevant here now, for example, in Iceland, where you have uh, volcanic uh, eruptions that are dis disturbing the, the life of people in, in, in cities there in Grindavik. Looking at my, my own background, so in, I think in 1996, actually, uh, I decided to start studying geology against the advice of my father, who is also a geologist, but uh, at that time, the, the economic situation in the world, and also, especially in Finland, was ra rather bleak. We had the, 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 the uh, serious depression going on. Uh, it was actually the same for the employment for geologists, as that was actually very much connected to the price of gold at the time, and the price was that at then at the, at the historically low levels. However, my personal interest was never in, in becoming a gold digger, but uh, I, I actually wanted to understand different, uh, how, how different uh, processes occur in nature and try to understand them. And uh, the thing is, what was fascinating for me is that actually the most of the bedrock you have here in Finland is about two billion years old. So it was, it's actually a sort of a, uh, like a crime scene, you're a detective trying to figure out where you see the evidence, where you have actually the rock, try to figure out that how has this formed based on understanding processes that occur in nature currently. You can use different type of methods, mineralogy, thermodynamics, you can use uh, uh, isotope chemistry and so forth. But anyway, so my, my plan, plan was actually to continue with this. I finished my master's. I was planning to continue with a doctoral study in geology. But then fate intervenes. And actually, the professor who I was planning to do my, my thesis for, he actually tragically died in an accident uh, hiking in Norwegian mountains. So at that time, I decided, OK, I. I, got good, I, I had good contacts at my university, actually, to the then Laboratory of Inorganic Chemistry. So I, I, I made a slight move, instead started uh, with the PhD in inorganic chemistry, developing various thermodynamic databases to predict, predict processes in, in the energy industry, or, or let's say, mainly connected to, to the ashes and salts that you have in in black liquor and biomass combustion. Uh, fortunately, it's the same thermodynamics that works both for geology and inorganic chemistry. And uh, about six years ago, I had uh, the opportunity to start as a, as a tenure track professor in, in uh, metallurgy here at Alto, continuing this sort of similar type of field, but for a different, different type of products. And perhaps, you can see from, from some of these uh, <coughs> pictures here that the common thread is uh, actually these 
molten phase, high temperature processes that, that have studied over, over, over time. <coughs> For you to put you on the map, some of these important industrial processes that are occurring at high temperatures where the molten phase has an important role. You have this black liquor combustion re re related to pulp and paper industry or the biorefineries. You have molten ash in biomass, waste combustion, of course, when you're dealing with steel and iron making, copper and nickel smelting and refining and so forth. You have, we, these, these play a very integral role. For me, it was, uh, I've started in the top, top two ones and then perhaps continued over, over the years going towards the, the copper and nickel smelting mainly. What we can say here especially is that uh, if you look at the Finnish industry, here we have been important globally, especially to develop these technologies that are used in in these uh, both in the in the uh, sort of the pulp and paper industry, biomass industry, and also in the metallurgical industry with companies like Valmet, Mezzo. And as an example here, I will perhaps start with this. This is actually not from metallurgical industry. This is a a pulp mill, I think in somewhere in Finland, uh, and here, as I mentioned, black liquor combustion. For those of you who know, you know what it is. But it isn't burning of illegal alcohol, black liquor at least. It is actually a side product from the, from the pulping processes and where, where you then actually, you, you combust this uh, product in order to re recover energy or recover heat and produce electricity as well as recover the chemicals. And it is actually, people perhaps don't know it always, it is one of the, the more important uh, biomass uh, energy sources that we have in Finland. And in this case, what you see is you have a molten phase that is then tapped out from this boiler uh, to be able to recover it with other processes. S taking this as an ex example, what type of melt-related processes in these boilers and furnaces are of relevance? Well, one thing is that... Uh, Especially if you are dealing with, uh, with some of these boilers where you have uh, deposits, for example, close to various type of heat exchangers or, or, or sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, uh, walls, for example, you don't want to have melt fraction in contact with that. If you have higher a bit of melt, it is risk for severe corrosion. Other example is... Uh, in, in, in certain type of furnaces, if you, if you have a melt fraction above, let's say, around 10-15%, these sort of mixtures, of solid-liquid mixtures, tend to become uh, sticky, so they can cause problematic deposition and plugging. And for this, I think I take a sort of perhaps more back-to-earth example that is slightly related to this. Perhaps for people, for those of you who, are, who want to help your children to how to make a sand castle. So the question is, what is the optimal ratio of sand to water for building, for building sand castles? You take a bucket of water, you take one bucket, bucket of sand, 50% water, nah, perhaps three buckets. Well, what some serious researchers have shown that eight buckets of, of, of sand per one bucket of water, which corresponds roughly to about 10-15% on, on, on a volume basis uh, of this liquid, liquid phase there that actually helps this material to, to, to stay together, to have its sort of mechanical uh, strength. And actually this is very much similar to what you see with these deposits that, that tend to stick to the walls and grow and, and cause, cause problems in various type of furnaces. Other examples we have, you know, if there's too fluid, you know, you get to a certain level that the deposits don't build up anymore. But then also, as very important for both the, both in, in, in metallurgical processes or pyrometallurgical processes or, or various type of, uh, or also in this, uh, let's say, smelt discharge from this black liquor recovery boiler, this smelt is not the melt, smelt is the term, it needs to be fully molten. So at, as close as possible to 100%. Otherwise, you get something like this, where where things if you have solid mixed solids mixed into this liquid, you start to plug up the 
the tap holes, for example. The final one, final example, and I tried to be take the sort of the example also from everyday life. One is actually in, in some metallurgical processes, like in, in, in copper smelting, you have you want to separate two different liquids. You have something called a slag, which typically takes care of the of the impurities, something called a mat. It is a sulfidic liquid that, for example, in copper smelting, it, the most of the copper hopefully goes into that phase. And these two liquids need to separate, so you can then uh, handle them later on. So if you want to experiment on this, perhaps you can do it even tonight when you're cooking. You make a salad dressing, you take your balsamico, you take your oil, oil and water more or less, you mix that and see how these different droplets start to separate into two liquids. So this, for example, has been studied both utilizing different type of modeling tools and experimental tools to see how these droplets, how they separate in, a, in, in, in both in this type of process. <coughs> so here were a couple of examples where we have where the liquid phase, molten phase, molten phase has, is of importance in our, in our industrial processes that are highly relevant to to do, for example, Finnish industry and also in general for future. As, because as mentioned, you know, importance of metal production, it increases all the time with the electrification of our society. Recycling increases, so we need to understand how these different processes, how they, how they work. And we know that inorganic melts, they play a very important role in both these pyrometallurgical processes, as well as in in other, let's say, chemical engine, more traditional chemical engineering, also connected perhaps to the, uh, the, the bioeconomy, for example. The challenge is, of course, that we have more and more complex ores, raw materials, more complex uh, feedstocks, leads to more complicated processes at the, at the same time as we have a need for new products and higher efficiency. But at least with, with thermodynamics, we have opportunities to, to at least predict that are these new processes and new products, are they, are they feasible to produce? So with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>